Okay guys, so in this video we're going to talk about the different labs that are available for apes. Now I won't have time to go over every single one of the labs, but I do want to take a minute and just kind of show you all the different variations that you can have. One of the benefits about our course is that you do not have to have specific labs, but there tend to be some kind of general, you should probably do these type of labs. So I'm going to show you in the CED again where this component is. So it's actually very early in the CED on page 7, okay, about the lab requirement. You are required to have the students use and do some form of lab. Um, it's meant to be a one semester introductory course and those courses have a lab component. This is not environmental studies, it's environmental science. So while the studies are included, they are going to have to actually um, do some science in your class while they're doing these things. So that's something that I would definitely uh, keep in mind. And again, some of the prereqs, they recommend that a student has at least a year of life in physical science. Um, that tends to be an easy thing, such as having uh, biology and chemistry. Um, but the big idea here is that they need to have 25% engaged in hands-on inquiry-based laboratory and or field work investigations. So they should not just be doing some simple cookie cutter labs. They should try to be doing as much investigation as possible um, and have it be inquiry-based. So that is required by College Board um, for this course. So it's not something that's negotiable, it's something that is required. So one of the documents I shared with all of my participants is these APES lab supplies, okay? now. By no means are all of our APES labs um, required. So just because I have these on here does not mean you have to do them all. Um, it just depends on you and how much you want to um, invest in the course. And again, what different formats you want. So you do not need to do these exactly as it's written. I mean, I myself don't do them always exactly like for a fish. I don't always use gambusia or mosquito fish. Sometimes I use your typical um, feeder fish types or goldfish. Um, so it just depends on what we what's available to you. This is just what I have found to be my common practices. Okay, so I'm going to go through all the different documents briefly to show you the different types of um, labs that we do and how you can actually make all these pretty much every single one inquiry based. Um, so we'll start with an easy one, Tragedy of the Commons. Okay, This lab activity is one I do at the beginning of the year that kind of discusses that overarching, overarching um, topic, which is that you know, the fact that resources are limited and a lot of the times free, they end up being over-harvested or overused. And so this is a pretty simple one to do. Uh, you can do this at the beginning of the year, and I like doing it at the beginning because it ends up kind of being that umbrella topic you can always go back to and say, well, you know, think about tragedy of the commons in the ocean or tragedy of the commons when it comes to uh, public land and so on and so forth or resources like uh, food and things like that. So definitely something that I would like to do early and their supplies for this are pretty simple. You just need to have some goldfish, some paper bags, um, I've seen some teachers do it more intense with straws and have the kids try to fight for the food that they are fishing for. So it depends on you and your style, but that's definitely one I do. And then one that also gets a little bit of challenge here is eco columns, right? Um, it's always a discussion about what should we need for eco columns. So this is the inventory list I show my students where they can get them. Um, and then there's some things that I provide as well in my class. So my class we tend to have quite a bit of seed types, um, balances, the gather data probes, which I'll show you in a separate video on how some of these work. Um, and of course, distilled water conditioner and things like that. So you know, that's a, a tool that I show my students at the beginning. And then of course, depending on how you want to do it, there's many resources and I know many teachers do this in different ways, but you can organize what they're doing here and I don't like to do a full-on closed system. A lot of teachers have got, have tried to do that, but it's very hard to keep one system up and running without any issues that way. So definitely something that um, to think about. And um, 
but this is kind of what I go over with them. And again, I just kind of show them the resources. And many of this stuff can be many of this can be done with stuff around the classroom uh, or the house. Not really something that you need to have, you know, hardcore equipment for. But of course, if you can use lab quests and vernier sensors or Pasco sensors, then you definitely should. Um, there's lots of really good resources out there. Okay. Another lab that we do is our oil spill cleanup. This is a great one because they kind of simulate the different ways that an oil spill can be done. This was a free response question not too long ago, I believe in 2016 or 17. Um, and so this is a way to simulate that um, in class without having to be too much of a mess. Um, and then they can discuss how these simple methods, you know, with um, gravel and sand and soap and things like that, how do those compare to the real life ways that an oil spill is cleaned up? And so this is a really good lab. Um, and again, depending on what you have, you can allow them to have different forms of cleanup materials. So these are not all the things you need, but it, you, know, you can have more of it um, that actually will help the kids create. And what's great about this is there's no right answer. I like a lab like this because there is no, well, you know, you have to have this, um, this set up and done and it needs to be a certain way to get a certain answer. This is very up in the air and kids will have different conclusions which is one of the things I like about a lab like this. And that's going to be something that College Board's um, very attuned to. Okay. Um, and then we also have Garbology. Garbology is one of my favorite labs because um, it's a way for students to kind of be aware of how much solid waste they're making. Um, and they can compare it to the national averages. These were from 2013. I mean, um, I would probably go look up more up-to-date data but it's a good comparison. And they basically just carry around their trash for a three to five day period. Um, and for me, I don't like to have my kids um, keep around the dirty trash, like toilet tissue, or let's say they have like a piece of chicken with a bone. I don't like them to carry around that trash. I tell them they can throw that part away, but they have to keep a uh, inventory of their dirty waste item. Okay, uh, and I would also, uh, lately I've been thinking about adding an option where maybe they take that stuff and if they're on campus, they would weigh it first. So that way, because usually what happens is we end up kind of eyeballing it and guessing what um, how much these things would weigh. Like if it were a chicken bone, we make a good guess about how many grams. But this is actually better if you have them, uh, maybe you have portable balances or you have a time where you say, okay, well, before you throw this away, come by and measure it, and then they can go from there. Uh, so that's a really great lab, typically done during the land use and land pollution unit. Okay. And then um, we also have our water quality lab. So this one right here is one from Vernier, from their water quality manual. So you can use the Vernier probes. They have dissolved oxygen, pH, turbidity. Um, they also have to dissolve solids. And you can use that to compare it to the water quality index and come up with a value for their water. And so you can have them collect water from different ponds or lakes around you. Um, or from, I've actually gotten really good results when there's this area that kind of floods in our part of town or our part of the country. Uh, we have little canals because of our irrigation for um, uh, citrus. And so that ends up being where some students have gotten the water from and they test it. And we tend to have really high nitrates and phosphates. And I will show you that later on. Vernier now makes probes where you can measure that by just sticking the probe in the water. There's no longer, you don't need to have a full water test kit. But this is a good form to use as well. And then um, we also have soil texture. We'll be running a, a sample of this this week uh, where you'll be able to do the soil texture in your hand on uh, in class and then uh, you can use the soil triangle and so this can be done with stuff at home you just need soil sample water rulers and a spoon so uh, nothing too intense there so that's a good lab and they will see the soil triangle so unless your student has been in agricultural classes then 
they probably have never seen that and don't know how to use it. So that is something to make sure you include when you're designing your course. And then I did used to use this one. This one I have not used in several years because it tortures a goldfish. You basically put water in the goldfish on a, a thermal plate or a hot plate and you raise the temperature and you see how long it takes for respiration to go up for the fish. And if you have a probe, you can measure the dissolved oxygen at the same time. So that's kind of a cool thing to do. I haven't done that in a long time, but you can if you'd like to get this idea uh, graphing in as well. So that's definitely something I would um, consider. You know, I may not, for me, I may not do that still, but it's an option, right? Actually, don't close that. And then uh, if we go beyond that, uh, there's a couple of sunscreen labs I like from, from Vernier. Um, they have UV probes, and now they have a light sensor probe where you can actually test different types of sunblock and be able to identify which SPF, sun protection factor, is best for blocking UVB or UVA, okay, if you can get both of those probes. So uh, definitely something I would consider, um, and I'll have a separate video about that as well. They also have UV investigations. What's great about Vernier is they will make a teacher and a student copy. So one will kind of have the cheat sheet for you. And then I do like doing mark recapture, even though it's not explicitly in the CED, but students do need to know how to do population exercise. So this would be one that a scientist might actually do, where they actually um, go out and look at a uh, population, and they try to mark some individuals and then see how many they recapture to estimate the population. So like I said, this is not specifically on the AP exam, but still something that students should be able to know and look at. Um, and then uh, you can also extend this with a um, uh, roly-poly lab or, or pill bugs. So uh, once the students have done that mark recapture with beans, they can then do the mark recapture in real life with roly-polies. I find this to be easiest when you have sort of some sort of a tub with soil and decomposing material and then you have you know the population that you put in there beforehand so that's one way i would definitely look at it and there's many many labs and like i said these are not the labs you absolutely have to do these are just the labs that have worked well for me and that i have used over the last few years um, i will and i have posted these in the google drive folder so that you can look at these and peruse them and see the supply list that you need for them all. So if there's any questions, please make sure to post um, on our um, either Blackboard or Canvas or other site so that we can go over any other questions or concerns you may have. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful and we'll go through some more detailed links later.